Hello and welcome to Jesse Bear Book Club Vlogs. Today we are talking about Adrian Mole, The Cappuccino Years, book five in the Adrian Mole series. This book picks up five years after Adrian Mole, The Wilderness Years. Adrian is now 30 years old, slightly balding, a father of one young three-year-old son who is exactly one month younger than me, called William, a divorcee, and he is working in a rather not brilliant restaurant called Savages in Soho. Now, the book opens with a list of principal characters, and then afterwards it goes on to talk about the love of his life, Pandora Braithwaite, being elected as the MP for Ashby de la Zeus. Ashby de la Zeus. And Pandora is elected the MP for that jurisdiction. The chapter where it describes election night is far too long and just a little bit dull. And it's kind of funny because he's so obsessed with her, he agrees to do, you know, like drive people to be voting, even if they're not Labour supporters, and Pandora of course is for Labour, but she's just as bitchy and horrible as ever. But I have earmarked a few bits throughout this book I want to talk about. One of my favourite things is at the, near the end of this book, about, I would say, about a quarter of the way through, Adrian discovers his son, Glenn Bott. And Glenn has been a slight fixture in the earlier books. In the wilderness years, he is alluded to, and Adrian is convinced that it's not his son. But there is a complete paternity struggle with Adrian's arch rival, Barry Kent. Barry Kent has also released a number more books in the... Dork's Diary collection, which Adrian is so not fond of. But continuing on, Adrian is working in Savage's restaurant, which has decided that it's going to have a very, what is it, a working class menu. And here I have got a list of the menu. Heinz tomato soup with white bread floaters as a starter. Grey lamb chops with boiled cabbage. Avec dan quail potatoes and brown onion gravy. For pudding, we have spotted dick, al clinton, bird's eye custard with the skin for six pounds extra, cheddar cheese, cream crackers, Nescafe, and an after eight mint. There are two types of wine on this menu, white, 46 pounds, and red, 46 pounds. Service charge not included. You're expected to smoke between courses. Pipes and cigars are particularly welcome. That kind of sums up where Adrian has been working for the last, you know, five years. He is now the head chef, but he cannot cook. All he does is defrost things. Moving along. Adrian is now getting divorced from Jojo, his Nigerian wife. Uh, he has left to go back to her home country and he is pretty convinced they're not really getting divorced even though they obviously are she's sending letters to his mother divorce proceedings are going ahead but he is convinced that they are not getting divorced and it's quite funny he also makes friends again with his childhood best friend nigel who is now a was a van driver for next and is very angry most of the time but this book is quite funny um Nigel finally comes out to his parents that he's gay and Adrian ends up outing him on the radio and it's just a bit ridiculous and it's funny. It's also quite sad, but it's very, very funny. But one of the funniest things about this book is Adrian Mole's Opal Fruits obsession. And as somebody born in 1994, I didn't know what Opal Fruits were and I had to Google it and they're Starburst. And how anybody can be addicted to Starburst, I have no idea. They are disgusting. I kind of like the green ones. I don't like any of the other ones, only the green ones. But, like, they get stuck in your teeth and they're just horrible. But he gets so obsessed with opal fruits that he ends up leaving the house at, like, one in the morning to go to the BP garage and buy some. And it's just not good. One of my favourite things in this book is Adrian Mole starts keeping a daily log of his intakes and outtakes. So... On this day, the 14th of May, we have two packets of opal fruits, alcohol, nil, cigarettes, nil, weight, 10 stone, 8 pounds, bowels, sluggish, ball spot, stable, he's obsessed with his ball spot, he keeps measuring it, <laughs> pains, throbbing big toe, left foot, spots, one on chin, penis function, 3 out of 10, drugs, 
Prozac and Nurofen. Like, he puts his penis function in on every single one of these entries. For I don't know why the reader needs to know, but it's still kind of funny. And then we've got the Friday the 16th of May. Opal fruits, three packets. Alcohol, six double vodka and tonics. Cigarettes, nil. Drugs, four Nurofen, one jazz cigarette shared with Malcolm the dishwasher. Bowels, no movement. Weight, eight stone, seven pounds. Thinning patch, stable. Spot on chin, yes, penis function, listless. What a word to describe one's penis, listless. Anyway, moving on. Adrian loses his job in the Soho restaurant, but in between him losing his job and being jobless living in his mother's house, he has a short-lived television career as a professional chef, where he cooks awful on a show called Awful Good. The whole theme of Awful Good is waste not, want not, and 1940s, you know, make do and mend. But he doesn't really know too much about the 1940s. You know, he did it in school, he knows a little bit, you know, he's thinking damn busters, like he wants that sort of look. Unfortunately, the makeup girl, the only thing she knows about the 1940s is Adolf Hitler, so she gives him a haircut that makes him look like Hitler, which is very unfortunate. Awful Good is a mild success. Um, unfortunately, Adrian is no longer the star. The star is a guy called Dev Singh, who is a comic genius, apparently, to everybody, apart from Adrian, who just thinks he's a buffoon. To sum up Adrian Mole's cookery, I think I have to use the term A.A. A. Gill used when describing his meal at Hoi Polloi. I forgot, it's Savage's owns the restaurant. It used to be Savage's now it's called Hoi Polloi, and A.A. A. Gill, the famous review artist who is now dead, who my parents were obsessed with for some reason, um, described Adrian Mole's sausages as a turd on a plate. The sausage on my plate could have been a turd, A.A. A. Gill. I can't actually find the article here. Adrian is then asked to write a cookery book for awful good, and he literally just doesn't. He has every opportunity, he could have, but he doesn't, and his mother ends up writing the book for him. Which, you know, is very, very kind of her, but then she expects half of what it made. Even though she did it as a present for Christmas, and I think that really sums up Adrian Mole's mother in the best possible sense. She does care, she does love him, but she's also quite self-centered. I don't know, I've never warmed to Adrian's mother. I know she's a fan favourite, I just don't overly like her. Well, anyway, after Adrian moves home, his mother, in the meantime, while all his cookery success or non-success has been going down, has been having an affair with Ivan Braithwaite, Pandora Braithwaite's father. And they kind of do a swap. So Ivan and Pauline get together, and Tanya and George Mole get together, Adrian's father, and they kind of swap houses. And it's just all a bit confusing and horrible. Especially for Adrian's poor sister, Rosie, who is very upset by Ivan being in their house. And, you know, acts out a bit. He gets a tattoo of a monkey on her stomach and then proceeds to get pregnant. And Adrian, you know, she tells Adrian and she decides to have an abortion. It's all quite upsetting. But I think my favourite line is he agrees to have her laser the monkey off her tummy because she describes it. It'll get stretched out to be the size of King Kong. I don't know, I found that really funny. I like Rosie in this book. She doesn't feature in many of the books, or if she does, it's only as a side character. But she's very good in this one. He describes her as being innocent even though she looks like Baby Spice, but she is not innocent, as her boyfriend said. I've had more than cider with Rosie. Continuing on, Adrian is now living at home. There's a whole, is Glenn bought his son? Is he Barry Kent's son? Who knows? Turns out he's Adrian's son. And Glenn, Glenn is such a sweet boy. Like, he might not be the, you know, the brightest bunny in the bunch, but he's lovely and he obviously really loves Adrian and is so happy Adrian is in his life. And I will give Adrian his dues. He completely takes, you know, Glenn under his wing. He looks after him, he embraces him. I think he feels quite bad, and he should, for refusing to acknowledge him for 13 years. But as the book goes on, Adrian inherits a house from a guy he drove to a polling station. And 
the house is a bit of a disaster, you know, the roof is leaking. There's quite a funny bit with his builders where he thinks his builders are making excuses to not deal with him. Turns out his builder's wife has just had her fingers cut off. And he ends up on the front page of, I think, the local newspaper. It's a good book. I think, I think it's about on par with The Wilderness Years. Maybe a little funnier? Maybe. I don't know. It's more kind of settled humour. He is older, he's a bit... he's nowhere near any wiser, but he definitely is more settled. It's more situational than in The Wilderness Years. In The Wilderness Years it's all just out there. Like he's stupid, he's dumb, doesn't know what he's doing with his life, he just kind of falls into things. In this one it's a lot more situational and he's trying much harder. I don't know, I like it. I always remember, I read this when I was about 14 and I think this is the last book in the series I read and then I took a break and then I went back to it. But I always remember his house burning down right at the end. That's how it ends, spoiler alert. Um, and I couldn't remember, I couldn't remember at all why his house burnt down and then of course Eleanor, Eleanor the arsonist burns his house down because his, his son Glenn's after-school tuition teacher falls desperately in love with Adrian. I mean, who could fall in love with Adrian? He is Adrian. And when he doesn't reciprocate, and she thinks he's having an affair with Pandora Braithwaite, she burns down his house. But, you know, Adrian is quite heroic. He rescues both his sons and, you know, you really like him at that point in the story. But there is a bit, and I've got to read you this because it's just ridiculous where he goes on a TV appearance, kind of, Dev Singh has had a nervous breakdown from the fame. He goes on a TV a TV interview to promote Awful Good the book and he stays in a hotel and he let his agent book his hotel and he describes the hotel as a minimalist nightmare of Japanese design and he cannot figure out how to flush the toilet. In fairness, I've seen some Japanese toilets and they are very confusing. Adrian during this book has also renamed his novel Lo the Flatlands of My Homeland to try and garner some, you know, popular support. He's renamed it Bird Watching. So it's kind of like train spotting. And I love train spotting, it's one of my favourite movies, it's one of my favourite books, you know, like it's a real teenage, you watch it, coming of age movie. Love that story, love the book, love the movie, love all of it. And he decides to rename Lo the Flatlands of My Homeland Bird Watching. And I don't think I picked up on this the first time I read it because I hadn't seen or really got into train spotting or Uring Welsh. So reading it this time I found that so funny. But he is also writing a comedy show called The White Van about a serial killer. And I don't know, it's it's in poor taste, you know, but a lot of Adrian stuff is in poor taste. And he gets he's really annoyed his agents secretary who, before she leaves and goes back to America, sends him a April Fool's Day letter saying that his white van show has been picked up by the BBC and Adrian believes it. And reading the letter it's obviously not from the BBC, it's handwritten, it's all just a bit, and he believes it's so hard and he falls for it. And it's, it's kind of heartbreaking because he faxes a copy of the letter to literally everyone he knows as proof that he is some sort of comic genius. Well, anyway, that's really all I've got to say about Adrian Moore, the cappuccino years. He doesn't drink that much cappuccino. It's mentioned probably about five times. So I think, I think Adrian Moore, middle age, might have served it better. Or unemployed Adrian Moore, perhaps, because he is unemployed most of this book. Or I don't know, Adrian Moore fatherhood. The cappuccino years doesn't it doesn't hit it for me. I know there's the wilderness years and stuff, but it's just could do with a different name. But that's my opinion. I give this book probably a good 7 out of 10. It's funny, some of it's a bit dry and I did have to look up a few of the political figures because as I said when this book when this book was set I was three, like I'm the same age nearly exactly as Adrian's son William and I did have to google a few people. <laughs> Like, I won't lie, he kept, like, describing people as looking like other people. So he would describe, like, somebody as looking as a politician, looking like a politician. And I would have to go on Google and, like, quickly look up what he was talking about. So it was, you know, maybe a bit of a research project for me. But solid 7 out of 10. Give it a go.
great addition to the Adrian Moore series. If you have liked this review, please like, comment and subscribe to this channel. I put out a new video at least once a week. Since recording this video, I have actually found out there is an Adrian Mole Cappuccino Years TV show. I think it was recorded by the BBC. I will leave a link to the episodes in the description of this video. Since recording this video, I have also started reading Adrian Mole The Lost Diaries 1999-2001. to And it seems to be quite good, though it opens with a time jump. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. You can also follow me on Instagram at Lady Jessica Riddell. Until next time, don't be an Adrian Mole. Bye!